So when you think about modern application development, there are a bunch of things that always stand out. Okay. You think about application server side application development today, you have very high data scale. Okay. We usually deal with a lot of, a lot of a data. Okay. This is very different compared to, you know, application development. I don't know, five years back, maybe five years back, we were still dealing with a lot of data. 10 years back, not so much, but these days, a lot of data. All right. And then we have high usage scale as well. A lot of users. And it's not just about number of users at a time. We have to scale to availability. We have to be available a lot of times, right? So that has to scale as well. Okay. Usage is scaling. We need it to scale. And then the third criteria is we are worried about costs a little more than we were earlier, right? When we had on-prem data servers, right? We would, we would hold, we would buy servers, hold it on our data centers, right? We all had our own data centers in our companies and we would run things there. Well, if we knew that we had, okay, we have, you know, 16 gigs of memory or 32 gigs of memory, you know that, yeah, it's okay if it's a little inefficient now because we've already paid for it, right? We're not paying anything extra. So we wouldn't worry so much about like nickel and diming, right? Every, every penny, every paisa, every small cent, whatever, like whatever is your currency, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't think about it for that small fraction. You would be like, yeah, I know it's okay if it's a little more expensive, but with cloud, you immediately see the impact of optimizations. You immediately see the impact of badly written code, which is inefficient because it impacts cloud costs. And now you combine that with the high usage scale. It means that every small inefficiency is multiplied by the amount of usage that you have, right? And if you have billions of users, that small inefficiency times a billion is what you're going to have to pay in cloud-based costs, right? That is a character. So these are three important characteristics of modern application development. So when you have these scaling, right? You have high data scale and high usage scale. Now, if I were to ask you, how do you scale up? How do you, how do you do the scaling, right? How do you add more users? How do you add more processes and all that? Well, there are two different ways of scaling, right? One is vertical scaling and the other is horizontal scaling. Okay. Vertical scaling is what allows you to, you know, increase the power of your computers and say, okay, I want to make this a little more powerful, add a little more RAM, you know, increase the processor size, whatever, right? Processor capacity. But horizontal is where the industry is going because vertical scaling has a, has a ceiling. And after a certain point, you can't scale vertically. You have to scale horizontal. Horizontal scaling means, in case you don't know, you just add more servers, right? But before you do any of these scaling, what you would first need to do is you need to optimize, right? Rather than scale unoptimized code, you would need to optimize. So considering how important resource utilization and optimization of code is, let's take a look at this example, right? So here is a piece of code. I want you to look at this and tell me what the problem with this thing is. Okay. What's the problem with this piece of code? It's not buggy, right? It's expected to work. There's no bug here. So basically what this is doing is it is it is basically a spring MVC controller. Okay. It's get user details. It's taking a user ID. It is making two requests to two services, right? It's calling user service dot get user ID, get user of the user ID. And there is something called user preferences service. It's saying get preferences of user ID. And then it's kind of combining the two. It's setting the preferences to this user and it's returning the user. All right. Assume that they're getting this data from the database. Get preferences can be an external. Yeah, the code has to wait for the method call to complete. I'm going to zoom into these two lines of code here, right? First line of code, which gets the user and the second line of code, which gets the preferences, right? It's doing two calls. So what you need is you need to return to the user a combination of these two right? You're calling one service, you're calling another service, you get those two, you kind of combine it, and then you return it to the user. Now, the problem here is that they're kind of blocking, right? So the first 
call and say, okay, go get user. We are now, after you issue this call, we are now waiting for this thing to return, all right? It's gone, it's calling the database, doing something. This thread, which is executing this, is just waiting, right? And once it returns, then it says, okay, now go get the preferences. And again, it waits, and only after those two return, then you're going, after, only after the second one returns, you're gonna go combine the result and then you're gonna send it, right? We are waiting for the thing to return. The first service needs to complete before the second service is even initiated, right? The second service doesn't depend on the first service. It has, it's just calling user ID, right? It's just passing user ID to get the preferences. This one's passing user ID, which is a string to get the user. There is no dependency. This thing doesn't have to wait for this thing to complete. But it is waiting because this is blocking, right? It's like delegating, a, you know, you, you, you have to delegate a work to a couple of friends, right? You say, hey, friend one, go do this thing. Friend two, go do this thing. And once we are back, you're both done, then we will continue with our work, right? So you tell something to friend one, friend one goes and does this. Friend two isn't going, it's just waiting, right? This, he or she is just waiting for the first friend to complete. It's like, there's no, there's no link. You don't have to wait. You can just go and do some work. But right now, it is not, right? So but the problem is that these two are unnecessarily sequential. They don't have to be sequential, but they are, right? So what's the cost we pay here? We pay the cost of performance, okay? There is another cost, but let's start with the simpler cost, right? The simpler cost is performance. Performance to the user who made the request, right? Somebody made the request. Somebody is sitting, you know, in front of a browser making the request. They get a response back, which is a little slower than it actually should be. Because instead of having those two run sequentially, if you had had them run in parallel, they would have saved time, right? Why wait for the first one to issue the second one? Okay, so it's the blocking, non-blocking code like in JavaScript. You have asynchronous operation like promises. Yes, yes. And there's a lot of inspiration from that programming paradigm. I don't think JavaScript innovated and created, like started that programming paradigm, but you will see a lot of common stuff that you see in like a Node.js uh, application when you learn Reactive, okay? There's a lot of commonalities there. Uh, all right, so, okay, let's say we are not worried about the performance of a single request, right? You say the performance, the, the cost was the performance for that user, right? That user made a request. We are unnecessarily having them sequential, and then that, poor person has to wait for a little bit longer. Fine, let's say we're not worried about that person, okay? We're not worried about the performance of a single request for a single user. Do we still care? Do we still have a problem? What else is a problem here? I'm gonna give you a hint. We are working on a web application, okay? That was a Spring MVC uh, controller that I gave as an example, right? It's a web application. So, Imagine this is a, a web application request handler, which is what was the example, right? We get a request and this is doing it. So what happens on the server? So here is, here's what happens. This is a, a screenshot from my older video because I couldn't be bothered to draw this again, but you get the idea. When a web server gets a request, it spins up a new thread to handle that request. Okay, it goes here is thread one. It's going and doing something. And there is a thread on the server, which is waiting for maybe get user to get data from the database or maybe get user preferences. Now another request comes in, it spawns up a new thread, right? And this is going and waiting for something. Another request comes in, this is going and waiting for something. So the problem is the longer it takes for you to respond to a request, the more likely there are more threads on the server, okay? So threads just keep adding, just keep piling up. And you have a web server with a lot of threads. At some point of time, it's gonna say, I cannot take on any more requests because this is my thread capacity. This, these are the amount of threads in my thread pool, or this is the memory capacity where I can hold my threads. I don't have any memory anymore to do more work. So it just doesn't take on more requests, right? So this is another problem, okay? The problem is idling threads. When you're calling get user, that thread is waiting 
for the Git user to complete. Okay. So instead of that, if we had done both the work, then it wouldn't have waited and that thread would ha wouldn't have existed on the server for that period of time. It would have gone off, done its work, and then something else would have, it would have, it would have had the capacity to handle another request. Okay. So this is the problem, idling threads, idling threads. And what's the cost? And we have wasted hardware, right? We have extra hardware, right? We talked about scaling up, scaling horizontally, vertically. Well, you got to do that scaling because now we are in this blocking mode, right? Extra hardware that you have to account for. So 